Hi! It's my honor to present you my work about ensuring reliable and predictable behavior of IEEE 802.1 CB, frame replication and elimination. My name is Lisa Meile and I'm from the Friedrich Alexander University in Erlangen-Nürnberg, which is in Germany. Let me surely give you an introduction about what this talk will be about. Well, in general, we will discuss time-sensitive networking, short TSN. TSN standards extend Ethernet to enable ultra-reliable and low-latency communication. The standard which we will discuss in particular is IEEE 802.1 CB. The whole name is Frame Replication and Elimination for Reliability, but we will just call it FRARE in this talk. FRARE was designed to offer protection against link and other transmission failures. And it does that by sending packets over two or more disjoint paths. FRARE should be configured to forward new packets, of course, because that's what we want to receive, new packets, but also to eliminate duplicate packets. It should eliminate duplicate packets because the underlying um, network operation should not be visible to the application itself. In this context, splitted flows of, of on disjoint passes are called member streams, whereas the group of member streams are called one compound stream. Duplicates in compound streams, so between the member streams, are identified using a so-called sequence recovery function. For this sequence recovery function to work properly and to identify which packet is new and which is duplicated, um, we need several configuration settings. And currently, the standard does not help the user how to configure this, this function. Therefore, in this talk, we focus on the configuration of safe sequence recovery functions. So, let's dive into it. While FRARE is essential for time-critical applications, the standard does not yet provide a guidance on its configuration, but leaves it up to the user. We identified four scenarios in which a correct configuration is particularly important. As far as we know, we are the first to provide formulas for users to set these configurations properly. In particular, we prove which configuration works when you have to choose between the recovery algorithms, you want to configure the length of the sequence history, or set the timer values for the sequence history. And also we study the effect of bursts if um, a link failure occurs. We show the correctness of our solutions both theoretically and in simulations. And we propose that these solutions could extend the existing standard to serve as a guidance for users in the future. As indicated in the first slides, we configure each stream, also called flow sometimes, separately. So to duplicate a stream and configure its duplication and elimination process properly, we simply need three main characteristics of the stream, which are defined in TSN, for example, in this standard. They are the class measurement interval, which is just, just the interval of its periodic sending, the maximum interval frames, which are the number of packets which are sent per interval, and the max frame size, which means how large are these packets in the worst case. So a stream sends at most MIF packets during an interval of length CMI, and each packet is smaller or equal to MFS. Besides these stream characteristics, we only need two additional information, which are the lowest delay of the fastest path, the best case, and the highest delay of the slowest path, the worst case. With this, we define a reception window, which we call delta D, which is just the difference between the two delays. As you can see here, the earliest packet in the best case will arrive after this delay here. And then for the time interval of length delta D, it is possible that we can receive some packet with this sequence number. It is important to note that in this talk, we only present our results for periodic sending and for one frame per interval. However, if you are interested in the results for aperiodic behavior, for chitter, or for multiple frames per interval, please refer to our paper. We start with choosing the right recovery algorithm. In the following, for each of the four limitations that we will present, we will always first introduce the problem, then shortly present our theoretical results, and conclude the topic with our simulation results. As a first step, 
Frere has two algorithms to identify duplicated packets. The simpler algorithm is called match recovery algorithm. It always stores the highest sequence number receives and eliminates only duplicate packets with this sequence number. All other packets are forwarded. This algorithm is only applicable to so-called intermittent streams. The definition of intermittent streams thereby is that when merging member streams, the difference between arrived sequence numbers may never exceed one. However, the standard does not provide guidance on how to identify whether a stream is intermittent. First, we identified that to ensure intermittent streams, it is required that all copies of a packet must arrive before the next sequence number can arrive at the eliminating device. In this figure, we illustrated the reception windows for multiple sequence numbers. Packets of 101 may arrive at the end of their reception window. Meanwhile, faster packets of 102 may already have arrived, thus violating the definition of intermittent streams. As a result, only flows for which the reception windows do not overlap are intermittent. Thus, for periodic sending, intermittent behavior is only guaranteed if the interval CMI is bigger than delta D. We used the simulation framework Omnet++ and then extended the nesting library to include Frere. To verify our equations, we set up a network for which we could change the path delays, resulting in different delta Ds. Then we configured the simulation to use the match recovery algorithm. As you can see here, the simulations were done with different CMI and delta D values. Configurations for which CMI is bigger than delta D are above the blue line. Here, all duplicates were safely identified, so no duplicate packet was passed. Also, all configurations below the line accepted at least one duplicate packet, illustrating that our boundary is not too cautious, but defines the optimal setting. For streams for which we cannot use the match recovery algorithm, we have to deal with a different problem, which is we need to find the optimal length for a sequence history. For non-intermittent streams, Frel offers the so-called vector recovery algorithm. The vector recovery algorithm offers more flexibility for the transmission behaviors of talkers by covering a wider range of sequence numbers. This range is defined like this here. Hereby, recuff sequence number is initialized with the first sequence number received. This interval is also illustrated here. Packets within the sequence number interval, which are already received, will be handled as duplicates. New packets are forwarded. Packets within the interval, but with a higher number than the current recuff sequence number, will shift the interval to the new number. So far, so good. <laughs> Packets that do not fall within the sequence number interval are discarded. Be aware that this may cause safety critical information to be discarded entirely. Currently, there is no information on when the interval length is safe. The default value in the standard is simply two. Packets are only safely handled if they are covered by the sequence number interval. Therefore, we need to ensure that the sequence numbers are only allowed to drop out of this history if they cannot arrive anymore. Therefore, the history constantly needs an entry for each sequence number that may be received at the current time. For this analysis, we illustrated the number of sequence numbers that can be received in our example here. To derive the optimal length of the sequence number interval, how many overlapping reception windows are possible. This number can be derived by n. And indeed, let us assume that the current recuff sequence number is 101. Then the highest sequence number that could follow is n higher. With n equals 3 in this example, the next sequence number could be 104. As you can see here, after 101, it would be possible that a packet of 104 arrives at the beginning of its reception window, while 102 and 3 are delayed. So the interval of, at the reception of 101 needs to cover also 104. The argumentation for the history, so for previous packets, is done analog. As we can only update the interval on the reception of new packets, we need to get rid of the seeding function for our final result. In our simulation, every packet whose sequence number is not within the sequence number interval increments a counter for rogue packets. As we can see, in all optimized configurations, no packet arrived outside the sequence number interval. 
resulting in no rope packets, as Frere was of course designed to protect against failures, it also implements mechanisms to react to failures, and one of them is a so-called reset timer. Assume a network in which some sort of failure happens before the packets are duplicated. As we see now, packets are lost. So the sequence number, which arrives after the failure has been fixed, may be much larger than the current sequence number. This, however, means that our recovery algorithm would from now on discard everything. To prevent this, Frere resets its sequence interval if no packets have arrived for a period of time. Each time a new packet has arrived, this timer restarts then. Currently, no value for this timer is provided, but we need to take particular care of it, as if the timer is configured too short, duplicates will be passed because the sequence number interval has been reset. If the timer is too long, valid packets from interrupted connections will be discarded entirely. So the solution for this problem has two sides. First, if no packet has arrived for a complete time of delta d, we know that a packet went missing entirely and we can safely trigger our reset. As seen here, if nothing arrives for this time, then the next packet definitely is new. However, if the interval is large or delta d is small, then we may trigger the reset in every single interval. And therefore, the optimal duration for this timer is delta d plus CMI. Our simulations observe the number of past duplicates using the vector recovery algorithm for different reset timeout values and delta d's. As minimum requirement, we derived that a timeout has to be longer than delta d. All simulated configurations above this line successfully prevented the passing of duplicates. But a small delta d can result in too many resets, which can be seen here. The optimal number of resets would have been 2 for this case. The optimal configuration, as desired, prevents this behavior. Additionally, what can be seen here is that the values which are significantly higher than our solution may discard new packets. The guidance, thus, should be to set the timer value equal to this equation. Finally, we observe another behavior which happens in the case of link failures, and this time we explain why packets might get unexpectedly bursty and how to derive the size of these bursts. Frere is designed to always forward the first arriving packet of each sequence number. However, this feature can result in an increase of burstiness. If a fast path experiences some link or transmission failure, this will result in three phases. We illustrate them here. Here we simply check the time of arrival of the first forwarded packet. So, we have one fast and one slow path, and generally packets from the faster path are of course forwarded first. Then the faster path fails and only packets from the slower path are received. However, they already have been received, so no packet is forwarded for a while. After a while, of course, new packets from the slower path would be received as well and transmitted at a normal rate as before. The burst occurs as soon as the faster path starts transmitting again. Then the remaining slower packets are still delivered but at the same time, new packets from the faster path arrive. And as we can see here, this resulted in a bursty arrival of packets. The rate of this burst is twice the normal rate, but how many packets will arrive in one burst? For this, we first derived that the duration of these bursts can never exceed delta d. We can then derive the maximum number of packets which can arrive during delta d from one of the links. Since both the recovered and the slower link deliver in the worst case, the number of packets in the burst is then twice this value. Again, when we simulated worst case scenarios with different path delays and link failures, we could show that this equation always matched the actual observed bursts. To sum it up, IEEE 802.1cb seeks to add reliability to critical traffic in TSN, but it can only do so if its configuration is correct. We have highlighted and presented four critical limitations of this standard. And for these, we have derived 
safe configurations, we have proved them and we have also validated them in simulation using Omnet.